Welcome back. We're still talking with Mr. Laddie Thompson and Mikey Jeffrey in our Abuja studio. Mr. Thompson, before we end on that break, you were talking about redirection and focus. You said it's, I, I took down something, you said it predates Nigeria, it's hydra headed, and now it's as if it's a redirected, they are redirecting towards a particular destination. Why do you think so? And how is it that the entire system or Nobody's seeing that redirection. Well, let, let me say this quickly, that even with the Boko Haram, I think we started work in 1999, touring Northern Nigeria and trying to get everybody to pay attention to the fact that uh, suicide bombings and an ideological you know, narrative was going to you know, rise in Nigeria. And I remember that the federal government was in denial for almost uh, eight nine years, ever before the federal government ever came to agree that we had this challenge. Now, that's not necessarily the fault of the federal government. It's just the fact that there's an intelligence behind these things. You want to remember that the global resurgence of Islamism is something that's recorded everywhere. There's nothing new about it. It's a, it's a global phenomenon. And practically every nation of the world has tried to tidy up. Now, the point is, until Nigeria begins to accept that we're dealing with intelligence beyond what we have been facing before, I'm talking about global intelligence now. First, for instance, when all these things started, I said to you that all that is happening is that the people who are after an objective have looked and when they saw that the cover of the Boko Haram was blown, they found out that the, um, the, the publicity had become toxic and so negative, it was obvious that the, the, the Boko Haram was not going to be as useful as they had hoped it would be. And then, of course, here comes a professional soldier who steps in and brings reform to the army to some degree, strengthens the Nigerian army, and then takes the strongholds of the, of the Boko Haram. Now, if you're an intelligent fool and you look at the fact that, look, they've matched violence for violence, this is not going to work anymore. To actually look around and say, what other assets do we have? What can we use? And like I said to you, right from 1804, there's been a narrative that's been there of, you know, and uh, using the force of arms, kidnapping, selling people as slaves, and this and that and that. Now, what does that mean? It means that in many families, stories have been told for generations. It means that in the enculturation program, there are some sections of the country that believe that, look, there's some leadership skills that are brought into your community or your tribe or whatever it is. And as long as these stories are informal stories that are passed through from line to line, it opens your heart with some degree of sympathy for what ordinarily some other people who have not been so exposed would have. So what we are facing really at the end of the day is the fact that the global intelligence has looked at the whole of West Africa, seen the spread of the headsmen, and they are right. It's not every single headsman that's actually Fulani. Okay, because nowadays they actually do employ some people who are not uh, full of needs. But the truth is this, the indoctrination is into something that's an ancient narrative. Mm. Now those who are arming them, the logistics, the strikes here, in the days of the Boko Haram, what they would do was to invent clashes. They say somebody uh, tore a Koran into two and then, you know, heightened tensions and all that. With this ones too, when they first started, they said, oh, it's clashes, or oh, somebody took a farm, somebody did this, somebody did that. But of course, as the thing has progressed, it has become obvious that this is not a matter of communal clashes. Now we are back to square one, because I remember that through the years we have spoken about the fact that one of the challenges we have here is that Nigeria itself, in its formative years, had many things that happened to us that divided us along certain lines. And any intelligent opponent of the country, as long as the forces that can tear the country apart are not attended to, any intelligent enemy of the country will exploit those fault lines. Let's go to Abuja, Mr. Ejiofor. Um When these killings happen, you hear, you know, condemnation from you know, government quarters, you know, from Nigerians. How can we move from this condemnation to action? Because Mr. Um, 
Larry Thompson said something about these attacks being intelligently coordinated. Is it that we are failing in intelligence gathering so that even before these attacks are carried out, you know, they are nipped at the very, you know, formative stages? Well, it, it goes beyond the condemnation of the acts. Uh, I expected that by now, even though Mr. President sent in some high-powered delegation like the Minister of Interior to go and visit Benue, the President himself should have issued a statement or even made a visit to Benue. We are talking of human lives. You can see the anger being ex expressed by the people of uh, Benue calling on Mr. President to come and intervene. The President would not go to the field to go and fight, but as a father of all, he's expected to say, please, we are looking into this matter, reassuring people that the uh, government is uh, concerned about the situation. So we, 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 need, we need to look at that. You can see if the chief security officer of the state, the governor, can say, we, will not have either, uh, we don't have any other option than to defend our land, what does it tell us? That the field that the government at the center has failed, and they have no other uh, option than to take the laws into their hands. Don't also forget that in Nigeria, you can easily acquire arms now. So suppose the, the farmers or the indigents begin to take laws into their hands. We'll have anarchy. So that's why I say we, we need to change the narratives. The narrative of this, looking at it from the uh, perspective of uh, headsmen uh, clash with farmers, <coughs> it goes beyond that. I'll tell you, I'll continue to emphasize this. For instance, when I was uh, kidnapped and we saw the heads, the, the, the gunmen, which I normally call them, we normally meet the, the headsmen with their cattle. What, what is the reaction? The, the headsmen will run away, abandon their, their, their cattle, abandon their heads. That shows you that it goes beyond the headsmen uh, and the uh, uh, farmers uh, clash. So what should we, we need doing? to change the narrative. Sorry. And there's no other way we can change the narrative than, than government looking, into, looking deeply into the activities of this uh, government. 